Okay, good morning. 
Our purpose in meeting with you today is to explain the Army's plan for force structure changes, especially those that affect the National Guard and the Reserve. We also hope to answer any questions you might have. But before I go on, I'd like to uh, say right up front how proud we are of the contributions of all the components of the Army in the global war on terrorism, uh, and that we are uh, uh, continuing to build an Army that is going to serve this nation the way uh, that the 21st century is going to call upon us to, uh, to serve. We think that it is important that you get an accurate picture from the Army's uniformed leadership regarding what we propose and how it will benefit the nation, our Army, and the states. First and foremost, the Army is committed to growing and balancing capabilities within and across active guard and reserve components of the Army. Our mission is simple. Support the nation's global operations, prevail in the global war on terrorism, and conduct expanded state and homeland security missions. To be clear, we have no intention of cutting the number of guard or reserve brigades, reducing the number of guard or reserve soldiers, or cutting the level of guard or reserve funding. We have every intention of building active guard and reserve units that are fully manned, trained, equipped, and led to perform the most likely missions that we will face in the 21st century operating environment. The Army Reserve and National Guard are no longer a strategic uh, reserve with months to prepare its people and equipment for deployment. Today, they are the, uh, nation, the nation's operational force and reserve. They must be ready on relatively short notice for wartime deployments or to react immediately to domestic situations and missions. On 9-11, given years of underfunding in the 90s, many Guard and Reserve and active units had low readiness levels. To meet recent wartime requirements, we had to pool personnel, vehicles, and equipment from across the force to make some units whole before deployment. This approach is not sustainable. Therefore, contrary to what some have heard, we are not cutting the number of brigades. The Guard will remain at 106 total brigades, 28 brigade combat teams, and 78 support brigades of varying types. The Reserve, the Army Reserve, will retain 58 supporting brigades. The only thing that will change is the mix of these components, and then a mix of units. Perhaps more importantly, something critics are not mentioning, we are absolutely committed to fully manning training and equipping these brigades, backed up by a robust and comprehensive modernization effort. In fact, regarding modernization, for the National Guard alone, we have budgeted approximately $21 billion <coughs> from 2005 to 2011, which is about a fourfold increase over the level of funding for equipment modernization from the 99 period. Turn now away from force structure and to the issue of end strength. At this time, the Army National Guard is authorized by law to reach 350,000 soldiers. This is not a change, but it actually has approximately 333,000 on the rolls. The Army Reserve is authorized 205,000 uh, soldiers and currently has approximately 188,000. Although our budget has program funding, for soldiers in uniform, we have committed to funding the Guard and Reserve to the level to which they can recruit up to their congressionally mandated end strengths. From a management perspective, this only makes sense. Given the current environment, we believe these plans are in the best interest of the nation, in the best interest of the states, and the best interest of the Army in service to the nation. Before uh, we take some questions, what I'd like to also end with here very quickly is that we are extraordinarily proud, again, of all the young men and women who are serving us, their families, and all of those that are not in uniform who are supporting us. What we're talking about here is different than the battlefield. This is much more mundane stuff, but it is crucial to our success on the battlefield and especially our success as we face these, these uh, increasing challenges of the 21st century. I'm going to turn it over here to uh, General Vaughn from the uh, Army National Guard and let him make statements.
Sir, thanks uh, very much. I, uh, I would anticipate, of course, quite a few uh, guard questions. So I, I just want to tell you, first of all, this is a great Army, great Army Reserve, great, uh, great guard. And uh, there's a lot of pride out there in what we're doing. And uh, when, we take, uh, when we talk about this 350,000 in strength, I can tell you that the states and the adjutant generals are now doing remarkable things. You need to kind of focus on what's going on. A lot of people will think, uh, think maybe we're not in such good shape on recruiting, and I can tell you we're setting all kinds of records right now. Uh, uh, people are dwelling on uh, too much pessimism here and what, uh, what the way ahead is going to be. So uh, we're going to move forward as one army. We're going to take this chance. We're going to take this uh, particular time in history to get our structure right. We're going to be collaborative with, with the TAGs and do this. And uh, I look forward to your questions. Uh, good morning. I would tell you that from my perspective, um, while this is important, and I won't say it's much ado about nothing, I'll say that this is, uh, this is a waypoint that has received some notoriety on a path that we've been embarked on for, uh, for some years. The Chief mentioned 9-11. After that, when I came into this position, I uh, quickly assessed that we were not structured, we were not prepared for the kinds of threats our nation faces in this century. We were prepared for those in the last century with a larger structure than strength. Uh, we've set about for some time uh, working with the Army and working within ourselves and with our National Guard brothers in arms to build a complementary force of skill-rich soldiers that complement capabilities in the Army and Joint Force. We're embarked on that. Uh, what's happening here is that similar to other or large organizations, the specificity of that starts to receive some notoriety. Uh, I would remind you in closing that bigger is not better. We know what better is in our Army. It is an Army that is strong as we are today. It is an Army that uh, self-perpetuates, that we grow for the future. We're doing that. And it is an Army that's ready and responsive. And this is all about making ourselves more ready, more responsive to the kinds of threats, as the Chief said, that we face in this century, as opposed to a sort of linear way of going about business in the last century. So we look forward to your questions. and. Uh, I echo what our chief has said. When you see our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, not only on the battlefield but here, you understand the real importance of this. It's not about numbers. It's about people. Thank you. General Schoolmaker, are you saying that you're not going to go to the 350,000 authorized end strength of the National Guard and you're going to keep it at 333,000? No. I said that we will fund to what they can recruit. If they recruit to 350000 the funding's there. Their authorization remains 350000 Do you believe you can get to 350000 Sir, I, I absolutely believe it. And um, I, I will tell you that, that as you look at the January numbers come out, and I'm in front of the chief on this because normally we keep them all together, but this is a very important press conference. <coughs> we set all-time records in December recruiting. We're getting ready to set an all-time January record for recruiting. We are on a we are on a glide path, you know, to get to 350,000, and the adjutant generals have pledged to do that. And when you have some real time to get into some details, we took a revolutionary approach to recruiting. We changed something that we've done not quite right all these years, and that'll be the subject of another another long conversation probably. But I, but I'm uh, firmly convinced, and I know, as are the adjutant generals, that they're going to make 350000 this year. And we'll lay those slides out uh, this, uh, this next week or so and show you what's going on. But there's a major success, success story uh, right in front of us on that. Well, General Schumacher, what about major opposition in Congress and among the governors that's been voiced in Congress among the governors to this plan? How are you going to get by that? Well, I think the, the important thing is we're listening to them, and we are working. Uh, together, and we, we met with all of the, uh, I think, what, 49 tags, and yes, then sir. the representatives are the ones we were missing uh, uh, the other night, and they had a lot to say, and we listened to them, and we're doing the adjustments, trying to balance uh, and reconcile, uh, both from the standpoint of the national strategic perspective as well as the perspective uh, in the impact at the local level. So I'm, I'm convinced that we're in a dialogue here that uh, uh, will bring us to resolution that is going to be best, as I said, for the whole thing. The other thing I, I want to tell you, th this, this imbalance is not going to be fixed in 2006 and 2007. This is a journey that we're on that is going to take a long time to reconcile. 
And so there will be a succession of budgets and, and, and programs that, that uh, are going to require uh, a sustained effort out of the Congress and, and uh, you know, out of the Department uh, to, uh, to bring us to resolution. When I said that we were underfunded, uh, and I'll, I'll be real specific here. Uh, we had uh, almost $100 billion in under-resourcing in the, in the decade prior to 2011 in investment accounts, just in the Army. That was part of that peace dividend everybody talked about. And the, the level of uh, a hollowness that existed across all components, it, to include uh, some hollowness in the active force and the, the uh, dearth in, in actual modernization uh, that was occurring, uh, hurt us when, as we uh, were preparing to go into this. And so we've had to go to extraordinary levels, and we've had great support out of Congress. We've had tremendous response out of these components that uh, beyond what was expected of them before. And so what we are trying to do is go to school on ourselves from what we've learned. And we are listening to people, and we are moving in a direction and informed by the kinds of things that we're doing and the level of operations that we've had uh, to rectify this and to put ourselves onto a path that is the path that this nation must be on. I mean, we have to do this. So would it be fair to say that you think you've developed a good plan within major budget problems for the foreseeable future? I, I wouldn't I say we have major budget problems. The United States Army uh, across the, uh, the force uh, is growing in terms of our base budget, and we've gotten extraordinary supplemental support to, to help us do what we're doing. Bob? Uh, what is the cost difference between the 333 level and the 350? To, in other words, what would it cost to grow that? I'll, I'll have to give it. I, I don't have a tough I don't have those numbers. But, but be, be sure that we've got the flexibility. You know, what, what we're talking about here is if we were at rest and everybody was inside their component and that we had not mobilized large numbers of soldiers, that this is, this is what you budget to. The reality is we have an army of over 600,000 people mobilized, which means that they're being paid for, these mobilized soldiers, with supplemental funding, which means they're uncovering program funding as though they were at home in their armories, which means we've got some flexibility uh, in reprogramming that we can do with the support of the Congress and the, and the administration to, uh, to do that. Can I ask General Vaughn a question? Sure. Uh, General, uh, the arguments that the adjutant generals have made in opposition to this plan, do you see merit in some aspects of their arguments in, oh. which, in, in which ways? Uh, ab absolutely. Uh, and as far as arguments, I, I got to tell you that, uh, that we as an Army had, had worked a uh, force structure piece, uh, unknown to a lot of people, of 348,000, those that, that deal with numbers. And you, and you realize that that force structure allowance is actually inside of 350. So they were already set and going that way to take that hollowness out of the Army Guard. 350 at end strength, and of course we have to attain that. And we were taking a structure inside the Army we had already agreed to take that structure, if we could, <clears throat> to 348. That had, been, that had been socialized with the tags. It had been worked with the governors, and it had been up to the hill, and it's been briefed to them, you know, at, at various times. And basically, when the, when the tags uh, met and uh, discussed this uh, with me, and uh, the, the chief will share you, his perspective of that, but all they, all they said is, look, you know, we... We want to take our force structure inside of our end strength. We got it, and we'll get there. Just give us time to help work what's best for the country in terms of the homeland and the war fight. And so as we explored these different excursions in force structure, you know, you'll hear a lot of bubbling out there. But believe me, we are on the right track on this thing, and the chief is standing there solid behind this thing, and he met with them. And again, he can he can discuss with you what uh, what his engagement uh, was with them. Let me, if I could just follow up on that, and then I'll take another question. I, I think that there, are, it, this is this is very uh, complicated stuff, and so I, I think the numbers you need to think about is the end strength is 350, and that's what it was before, and that's what it's going to stay. What we had before was force structure allowance. In other words, there were spaces, there were units that had more spaces than there was end strength. How, by, by how much? Uh, 27,000 right now. 
Yeah, but before before we 30, started thirty three thousand when okay. we started this. So we had we had all these extra spaces without people to fill them, and what happened was that allows a lot of migration around, uh, you know, in there. Therefore, you get this hollowness. It also does not allow you to have what the active force has, which is called a TTHS account. This is where you hold people that are not in units that are in school or in a hospital or, trans or, or, or moving around. And so when we talk about end strength, end strength is what's, what we pay for and what's, you know, those are faces, those are people. When we talk about force structure allowance, we're talking about actual unit spaces. It is healthy to have a delta between your end strength and your force structure allowance. In the active force, we have over 50,000 delta there. That's how we send people to the War College and to Leavenworth and everything without making a hole in a unit. And so that's what we need in the Guard and Reserve so that we can fix this problem of having people that are not MOS qualified, people that have not been to the basic course and all of this that are sitting inside of units. And you can only do that if you, if you establish this account and get your stuff balanced. So this is, this is the arcane discussion that's going on that, uh, that w it, what we're trying to do is build about an 8,000 TTHS account inside the National Guard, as an example, so that we can move people around and get them rebalanced because we have a tremendous amount of rebalancing going on. So, you know, the discussion about cuts, uh, we are not cutting brigades. Uh, we are trying to balance the force structure allowance inside the end strength, and we will pay to the level at up to 350000 in the Guard, up to 200000 in the uh, in the Army Reserve, if they can recruit to that level. Please, go ahead. Yes, the uh, National Guard Combat Brigades, initially the goal was 34 brigades, now it's 28. So why was that goal revised down, and if you're not actually cutting brigades, what are those extra people going to be doing? There, we're, we're going to rebalance the people that are in those brigades into things that are more useful that we need, both for the, for the Army at the national strategy level to, to the, as well as the states. Things like engineers, as an example, that, that we need more of. Things like transportation, et cetera. So now, the reason you're changing the combat brigades has to do with needs, other needs that you well, have? Well, let me, let me explain to you what, what was happening in the, in the Guard. Uh, the Guard had 34 com uh, brigades, combat brigades, and we, because of the resourcing situation, had what was called 15 of those enhanced. You might have heard the enhanced brigades. Those were brigades that, in fact, had a higher level of readiness and had more, more of their equipment present and were a man to that level and trained a little bit higher level than the other brigades. In the, uh, in the active force, of course, we we're trying to maintain uh, equal readiness across the board. In, in the Guard, we had, had this kind of a thing. What we are doing is building from the 15 enhanced brigades to 28 fully manned, resourced, trained brigades, equipped brigades, just like they are on the active force. This is, this is a tremendous investment. This is not taking things down. This is building wholeness up to 28 rather than some so the 15. Now, let me give you a couple other numbers. We, we have deployed about 55 brigade combat teams uh, equivalents out of the active force on the, so far on this. Uh, about uh, uh, 13 of those brigades have been twice, and two of them have been three times in rotation. We've deployed 15 brigade combat team equivalents out of the National Guard, and they have done wonderfully. But as we said, we had to aggregate, just like we had to in the and the other, and we have touched all 34 brigades. Is that fair to say? Across, across, across the, the entire guard. All the missions. On all the missions on the thing. So, what we are now doing is building capacity in here, and we are shifting force structure so that we get a better balance of capacity inside the guard. This is like a Rubik's Cube, and we are moving wholeness around in a balance that we need. And this is difficult. I mean, there's a lot of change. It impacts people at all levels, and it, it requires a great deal of of explanation, but, but boy, if you look at the level of resource and commitment that we've got into, into this transformational effort, uh, they, that, that will speak for themselves. Please go ahead. I think I understand, but I mean, if there's, uh, if it's as straightforward as that, why is there so much confusion on the Hill? Why are these folks lined up against your plans? Uh, first of all, we've used 34 brigades all over the world. And we've had to cross level big time since 9 11 to make this happen because we have had this force structure in strength imbalance. We put 26,000 folks, you know, guarding bases, 
chem ammo plants. We've carried the all the Noble Eagle stuff with our brigades and our divisions. We do the Kosovo S4 <coughs> big time, you know, with Ron, you know, we're on the other side. We've taken the Sinai and we've taken a heck of a chunk in Afghanistan in the training. And as the chief related, we've had a, a big investment uh, in Iraq. We can't build combat power today until we mobilize and cross-level our soldiers because of the thing the chief talked about. We don't have a TTHS account. So you know where that really affects communities and employers and whatnot is it takes folks away from their families for 18 months rather than 10 or 11 months. And you see, if we could build that combat power before we mobilize, we'd be a heck of a lot better off. Now, what we've done, again, what I said earlier, is we socialized and worked with the states and the governors to 348,000 in the force structure allowance. This is 28 fully resourced, trained, and equipped BCTs. We've never been fully resourced with anything. I mean, in the history of the Guard, We've been on the bottom end of this thing. So this, this gives us an opportunity to give up on that first step, you know, in terms of equipment. He talked to the $21 billion. That's a big deal for us. No one's ever made that kind of a commitment to the National Guard. 28 BCTs. Now, there are 34 brigades out there. Collaboratively with the TAGs, we've got to figure out how we work through what's best for the nation here in the homeland and in time of war. And the adjutant generals and states have, a, have a, a big part of that. They will help figure that piece out. And they pledged to the chief to do just exactly that. Now, what those other brigades consist of, think about this. We're in a long war. We still have to crawl. Even if we drop the hammer today to do something different, we still got a cross level. We have to have all those brigades for some period of time until we get our force structure right, whatever that right is. And that right happens to be a heck of a lot of combat engineers. It happens to be aviation. It's all the way across the force. And there have been a number of excursions run. And the chief put that fire out and said, it's 348 like you're doing now. See if you can take that thing to 342 with an 8K TTHS there will be no cuts in any armories out there, and the and the end strength will say stay at three hundred and fifty thousand, and the excursions that that we run based on a lot of other stuff right now, it you know once that that he talked to the tags up here had the had the tags concerns and of course he he caught me real quick and said let's let's get this right, it's the time to get this right and that's what we're going to do we're going to we're going to get it right for America. But you're openly saying now that you will not be using as many guard members in Iraq in the coming year and the following years. Is that what uh, increases your the feeling that you you can uh, you can recruit recruit more people? Isn't that one reason why you've had difficulty recruiting? I think it's been it's just the opposite. I think what we found is those that are deployed have been the ones with the highest propensity to to uh, reenlist. That's certainly what we've seen across the components. On. Well, on the deal. Go ahead. Have yeah. fewer guard people in Iraq. Let, let's let some other people ask questions. Gentlemen, you've described um, what we're talking about here today as, as arcane, as complicated. I'm wondering if you could try to, in the most basic terms, using no acronyms, um, that the you know talk to the average American sitting on their porch in Kansas and, and tell them how this what you're talking about today will impact their life, their security, their safety, if they have a son or a daughter in the Guard, how, how this will change their lives. Can you just really <clears throat> cut to the core and make it understandable for them? This will be, it's not just the Guard, it's the entire Army, and the Guard is an important part of the Army, and what we are doing is balancing the entire Army across all components to match the requirements that we're going to have for the 21st century. There's no acronym in anything that I just said. The second thing is we're designing an Army Force Generation model that we have started to populate that will have active guard and reserve units on a predictable rotational path so we can tell people two years from now your unit, reserve unit, guard unit, active unit is going to be in the hoop, prepared to deploy to whatever is going to happen. And we line things up so that people have some predictability in life and because of the modular nature of the force we now can interchange active guard and reserve seamlessly. 
What it means to the American people is they're getting better return on their dollar, their tax dollar, and they're getting greater <coughs> security, and we're getting better predictability for the soldiers and their family members, and better management of the force. Chief, no, I can't. Yeah, go ahead. Please. I think if I were to put that in the hometown America context, we'll put it in the case of a fire department that we're all dependent on. We have a fire department that has 10 fire engines, and but we only have the fire crews for eight of those fire engines. And so the American people, as we've seen, whether it's for war in Iraq, Afghanistan, or whether it's for hometown support, uh, want responsiveness and readiness. They want capability applied. So if they want uh, 10 fire engines, if the fire demands 10 fire engines, they want them to show up in time to quell the fire and to quell the suffering. And they don't want us to have to call on the town next door to provide more fire crews. They want their fire crews to be ready. Uh, I've used that analogy because, uh, frankly, though not as visible, the Army Reserve's been out, frankly, planning for this for the last couple of years, and I've been asked those questions frequently. As you just said, help us understand out here where we are, rather than in Pentagonese, if you will, which is, I think, what you accused us of. So that's my response to try to help the communications effort here, whether it's the regular Army, the active component, the Army National Guard, or ourselves. America wants capability, responsiveness, and readiness, and it wants quality of effort. It doesn't want us to sit back here and say we have to take 90 days to move people all around to fill the requirement because then what happens to those other towns fire departments when you pull their firemen they're empty they're in fact they're more empty so that's just, a, just a, my simple effort perhaps as a former infantryman i hope that came across general for all three how many reserve component brigades right now are butting up against the two-year within five year limitation in terms of deployments and how will that how will that impact the stress on the <coughs> army the active duty army if, if you have more reserve component uh, brigades off the table basically for iraq could you flesh out how you're going to manage that issue well that's a, that's a great question the the army force generation model will really help us manage that and what a, what a lot of, of folks don't really pay attention to is that we we regenerate a, a certain percentage of our force every year you know those those new recruits and folks that come in from from the other service uh, so and, and that's about 18 percent across the line so when you start to look at that in broad terms and if it was flat line over five years you'd say well you 90% of your soldiers are almost all new in five years. That's true. So you see, once every five years, we come real close to regenerating the whole force anyway. What ends up staying in your force over that period of time are the people who want to stay there, which are your leaders, which, which is the way it ought to be. So, so to give you exactness on how many are buttoned up against that, uh, all, of, all of the brigades have been deployed, but within each brigade and each battalion, that percentage is continually to getting better that haven't deployed as far away from the deployment as you can be. Does that make sense to you? We're getting ready to regenerate our force all over again. Wait, let me uh, let me just add to that, and then I'll call on you. The take the Third Infantry Division, who is now returning from Baghdad. That division has finished its second tour. Sixty-two percent of the Third Infantry Division had been on the previous rotation somewhere. Fifty percent of fifty percent of it had been in the third infantry division on the previous. Twelve percent had come from another unit wanted to go back with the third infantry division. And the third infantry division's reenlistment rate this year in Baghdad was 136 percent. Okay? It, it, it is what he's saying uh, happens at a little faster speed in the active force, but it's exactly the same dynamic as, as you go through. It, it is it's like a river. Please go ahead. I have an active duty army question. Mm -hmm. um, you have 19,000 fewer privates now than you did in September of 2001, and you're trying to grow to 512. Mm -hmm. um, this year, uh, or last year, you ended with about 6,000 fewer soldiers in the entire army, or in, in the active duty army, than you did the year before. Um, are you setting your recruiting goals high enough to reach that 512? And when do you think you will hit 512, if um, at all? Well, I think you're, you're mischaracterizing it a little bit. We set our goal higher last year, and we missed our recruiting goal of 80,000 by 6,000. Right. 
and that goal was set higher over the previous year to grow the Army. Right. And no, well, even if you had reached that goal last right. year, your Army would have stayed the same size because you're 6,000 fewer now. If you had gotten all 6,700 that you missed last year, you would be the same size well, as you I, were last well, year. I'm, I'll have to go back and we'll have to give you some figures because I can't, you know, I can't oh, st feel <laughs> stupid like that. But it, well, let me, let me just, Maybe the five if, if you look you across, uh, we, we are setting our goals to grow the force. Right. That's what we're doing. We're setting our goals to grow the force. It is not only what we recruit, but what we retain. Mm -hmm. uh, we are recruiting across the active guard and reserve every year. Our goals are the size of the entire Marine Corps. The Marine Corps is about 177,000 uh, Marines, and our recruiting goal across Active Guard and Reserve in the Army is, is right at about 175,000, I believe. Uh, it's, in the, it's in that category. It might be a little bit higher than that. If you take a look at our uh, retention, uh, last year in the Active Force, we set a retention goal that was higher than before, and we exceeded that retention goal. But, so, the, but the Army's smaller this year than it was last year, and you're trying to grow it. So when do you hit 512 under your current projection? Well, I, I guess I can't answer the question. I'm going to have to, I'm, because I don't agree with your characterization of it. So I, I'm going to have to look at it. Do okay. you have some concerns about the cartoon in the Washington Post? There was a, net, a letter to the Glad editor. Glad you asked that one. Thank you, sir. We're all very upset about that. We think it uh, is exactly what we said in our letter. That was not a letter that was hard to write. In fact, uh, you know, as far as I was concerned, I'd written it a little bit stronger. Could you, so, could you tell us what you said in the letter? Uh, you can read the letter. It's on the. Uh, it's in the paper. Have you gotten and, any uh, response from the Washington Post, sir? Excuse me. Have you gotten any response from the Post? Uh, yet? It's, they published it in the editorial page. I understand. Is that correct? Right. So, you know. General, can you quickly address the issue of equipment? Because you said $21 billion over the next five years, and that's a major issue with a lot of guard <coughs> units with their equipment mm -hmm. in Iraq or broken. How soon, for people sitting across the country, how soon will they actually see that money being reinvested to seeing their guard units fully re-equipped? Uh, this is going to take time. It's going to take time in the active force, too. Last, on the 22nd of November of uh, 2005, we issued our 500,000 set of soldier equipment, the new soldier equipment, what we call the uh, RFI, Rapid Fielding Initiative. We are now at about 700,000 sets of body armor. We didn't pop it like popcorn. It took two years from the time we dropped that money in there to build it. You know where we started on up-armored Humvees. We now have over 11,000 uh, up-armored Humvees in Iraq alone, level one, and we started with about 500 worldwide in the Army. So the, the difficulty in this whole thing is that the impact of your investments take months and years to realize. And so that is why it's so important that we do this and get this balance and get this investment done and do it. I'll say it one more time. I've testified before the Hill. Nobody would invest in the stock market the way that we invest in defense. We wait till there's a problem and buy high, and then we sell low. And we can't continue to do that. So I think, are we done? Okay, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Could you at least, from the podium, address the reserve component mix in Iraq over the next year? It's going to reduce, drop, apparently. Can you just give a sense of how much, how it's been like 40 percent and it's going to drop? To we're, going to continue to, we're going to continue to meet the combat and commander's requirement on that. I mean, I'm in the business of force provision, so, you know, our, you know, you, you will see what's announced when it's announced, and we will continue to do it, but you're correct. There is, there is less of, a, of a, uh, a reliance on the reserve components in this particular rotation. The reason we had a high reliance on reserve component last rotation was to give the active force time to get the 101st and the 4th ID moduli so we can get them over there and take some of the stress off of things. Can you that it was roughly 40 percent that's going to drop in this you next know, rotation at 20 or 25, just whatever it is? Uh, uh, we, we probably would, ought to we would go into details too. on yeah. that. Uh, it appears to be uh, uh, quite a bit, quite a bit less, and yeah. so uh, it's probably a fair characterization. We can, we can get the figures. We'll uh, yeah, oh, thanks very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.